Hi guys, this is Charles. I'm one of the surgeons at South Falls. Today, for a change, we're doing a mass over the left hip with a flank fold up. This is the third one I've done in a row um, recently, and so we've got this mast cell tumor here that was biopsied previously as a low-grade mast cell tumor, so the risk of metastasis is very low. We have done a CT scan to confirm that there's no evidence of metastasis, and CT suggested that um, I needed to take out about uh, probably 11 centimeters around the tumor uh, diameter to be confident that I'm getting a clean margin. So I'm doing um, three centimeters around what I can palpate. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so that you get a ding on your phone the next time we live stream. So that's our intended cut there. And then we're doing another flank fold flap here, which I'll base down here, bridging incision like this. Make a nice wide flap like that. So that's our intended surgery right there. Um, if you have any questions, we do have the live or the live chat running, so feel free to ask. I'll see if I can answer them. And go ahead and scrub in, Michael. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to do my tumor excision first. So a little bit of a difference in behavior between soft tissue sarcomas and mast cell tumors. Um, grade one and two, or lower intermediate grade, soft tissue sarcomas metastasize in about 10% of cases, and high-grade tumors metastasize in about 50% of cases, um, in contrast to mast cell tumors where low and intermediate grade mast cell tumors spread in between 5 and 15%, and then high grades metastasize in 85 to 100%. So a high-grade mast cell tumor um, is really bad in general, um, and very, very high chance of secondary spread, whereas a high-grade soft tissue sarcoma has only about 50% chance of secondary spread. The other difference is the location to which they metastasize. So mast cell tumors tend to go to lymph node, spleen, liver, and maybe bone marrow, whereas soft tissue sarcomas tend to go to lungs. Occasionally, they'll go to a lymph node. So uh, that's one difference there. The other big difference is that Chemotherapy um, is of benefit in preventing metastasis from mast cell tumors, whereas it is not of a benefit in preventing metastasis from soft tissue sarcomas. So that's an important distinction. Um, I don't routinely image the lungs with mast cell tumors because I have never seen a mast cell tumor metastasize to the lungs. Um, I think that it's probably reported very, very rarely. The only thing that you'd want to look at on an X-ray, chest X-ray with a dog with mast cell disease is to look at substernal lymph nodes to see if there's evidence of enlargement. Um, whereas with soft tissue sarcomas, you definitely want to radiograph the thorax, even in low-grade tumors, just in case. Um, it's one of the rare, rare, rare situations that it has metastasized, or um, if there's something else going on, like a another primary lung tumor. Um, and for that reason, um, I guess you can make a case for radiographing the lungs of mast cell tumors as well, but it's not for the actual spread of the mast cell disease into the lungs. It's just uh, as a complete minimum database to make sure that you don't see evidence of spread of an, or don't see evidence of another tumor. Generally, chemotherapy for mast cell disease, you've got three different protocols. One is palladia, and that's generally going to be more effective if you have the C-kit mutation. Um, you can use um, CVP, which is cyclophosphamide, vinblastine, and prednisolone, or you can use lamustine or CCNU. Um, and the general thought is that chemotherapy is going to double to triple the survival time. 
in grade or high grade mast cell tumors compared to not using chemotherapy. So I'm down to the ischiatic tuberosity here. Sciatic nerve is deep to the area that we're working. And so if you see twitching of the leg, it's not because the dog can feel it, it's because we're directly stimulating uh, the nerve. And so I always get complaints from people that are watching the live stream saying that the dog was awake when I did the surgery. Um, but that's not the case. It's just that we're directly stimulating either the muscle or the nerve. So no complaints, please. Tell me if my head's in the way. No, sorry. So I'm down to biceps muscle here. I think I'm down to gluteal muscle here. So I'm through the biceps or uh, cranial to the biceps muscle in that area and down to gluteal muscle. So now I'm just going to take some external biceps fascia. Can we get some mepivacaine, please? And I'll grab a um, right angle, I think. So I'm not going full thickness, just taking partial thickness. It's hard to remove the external fascia, the biceps muscle, without taking some muscle belly. So that's down to the ischiatic tuberosity. So I'm through the top of the biceps muscle there. So right on top of it, and just tickle the sciatic nerve there. Sure here. Thanks, Michael. That's right, got it. Do I have what? Genotype? Genotype. No, I don't have a genotype on this. And there's a question about clamps. Uh, no, I'm not aware of it doing that. Good question though. So the question is whether the muscle can cramp from the stimulation. So let's see what we got here. You guys see how um, 
Hush jumped in there with instruments to help retract and stuff. So that's a really good thing to do when you're assisting a surgeon is to get in there and All right, so that's our resection there. Again, to review, this is biceps muscle here, middle gluteal, greater trochanter, superficial gluteal is up here, ischiatic tuberosity, semitendinosis right there. So now we're going to infiltrate with, and the sciatic nerve is sitting right in there. So we're gonna infiltrate with mepivacaine and then do a splash block with the remaining and see if there's any chance that I can close this primarily. I don't think so. Yeah, that would be a stretch, literally. Okay, so now we'll harvest our flap here. Make our bridge incision here. Come around the other side. It's a very robust blood supply in this area here. This is a nice big dog, so we've got lots of room in the donor site. All right, I'm going to try to avoid using electric artery on the base of the flap if I can. That's the deep circumflex iliac ventral branch right there, which is the base of its own axial pattern flap. Can I get some new Metzenbaum scissors? These are pretty dull. Thank you.
Are the black ones, please? Right, so that will stretch around really nicely here. Just like that. And we'll bring that down and start thinking about closing our donor site. Um, can I please have some 2 PDS? Thank you. Um, let's send these scissors off to get sharpened. Not a lot of questions here, which means that a lot of you must have watched the live stream earlier today. Just lift up on that for me, please. Cut, so cut the sutures about four millimeters, please. Okay, so. Michael, do you want to come around and take Piyush's place for a little while? Just to mix things up a little bit? Yeah. and just push on the skin like you're doing. It'll give me a little bit more slack. So you're just trying to do a sub Q closure here just to try to approximate the edges a little bit. So anybody want to hazard a guess as to what the most important prognostic indicator for mast cell disease is? Either in-house or people that are watching from outside. If some, what's that? Yeah, more important than that. So if somebody says, I've got a mast cell tumor, what's the first question I'm going to ask? What grade? That's exactly right. So grade is the most important prognostic indicator. What about soft tissue sarcoma? Somebody says, I've got a soft tissue sarcoma. Metastatic spread. What's that? Metastatic spread. Okay, metastatic spread. Um, and also grade, really important. And then really important with soft tissue sarcomas is location. So extremity soft tissue sarcomas have generally a really good prognosis. Soft tissue sarcomas that are on the maxilla, for example, or on the skull, are going to have a more guarded prognosis. People often ask about this dog ear here that's at the top of our donor site, and that will stretch out with time. A. To break up the incision. Yeah, I usually don't. I just do a simple continuous one. Okay. 
one mil, perfect, thank you. All right, so let's have a look at what we've got here. Let's see how much we're gonna be able to stretch this out. Can I get some 3.0 PDS, please? Thank you. So I'm just going to do a sub Q closure. Start from up here. Thank you. That's great, Michael. Thank you. Did we did we read the FNA? No, no mouse cells that you could see? I see it. Okay, so we had another little mouse subcutaneous, or cutaneously, another part of the leg, and so we did a quick aspirate to make sure it wasn't another mouse cell tumor, and we didn't have any evidence that it was based on cytology, so we will not be taking that one off. Can you run that for me that way? Yep. Anybody know what the most important prognostic indicator for lymphoma is? Well, one of, I don't know, know a lot about lymphoma, but one is um, whether they have clinical signs or not. So if they're, phys if they're unwell. What about with osteosarcoma? Most important prognostic indicator is tumor size. So big is bad. So if somebody says to me, my dog's got an osteosarcoma. I'm interested in number one, where is it? Appendicular versus on the maxilla versus the mandible versus the digit. Because digital and mandibular osteosarcoma does better. Maxillary osteosarcoma does worse. Um, and then I'm going to want to know the size. So appendicular osteosarcomas that are small have a much better prognosis than ones that are big. that I might release this a little bit. Hopefully I don't cut my suture. Okay. Stretch out a little bit more nicely.
Can I get some more three O, please? Yes, please. Okay, now I'm going to undermine this just a little bit because it's going to be under a little bit of tension. And the skin is really closely adhered to the um, biceps. It's one of the places in the body where it's most closely adhered. It'll give me a little bit more mobility here. I'll see if I can get a sub Q closure here. I'm not sure if I'll have enough tissue. Since I have a captive audience, I'll keep quizzing you. What are three common rib tumors that we see? So chest wall. Osteosarcoma is one. Chondrosarcoma is two. Yeah. So what's a common tumor that we see anywhere associated with the musculoskeletal system? Yeah. So osteosarcoma chondrosarcoma and soft tissue sarcoma. And when they're on the chest wall, they're going to behave the same way as they do anywhere else. So osteosarcomas are going to have a median survival time of about a year with surgery and chemotherapy. Chondrosarcomas basically are going to behave like a soft tissue sarcoma. So they're about four years median survival time. And Osteosarcomas are going to behave just like if they occurred on the appendicular skeleton, which means that they're going to have, did I already say that, of a year? And then soft tissue sarcomas are about four years as well. And in preparation for a case that we have coming in tomorrow, what's the best treatment for transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder? It's tricky because it's normally the trigonal Yeah. So surgery is not a great option, not a great generally. Option. Yeah. It pains me to say that as a surgeon. <laughs> so what else would we treat it with? Okay, before we do that, we're going to do something else. Staging? Well, staging is good, but treatment-wise. Like if you diagnose a transitional cell carcinoma in practice, what, what are you going to do to treat it? Start it on paroxicam. So paroxicam just by itself carries a median survival time of about six months. 
Um, and dogs that are obstructed often will become unobstructed. Um, and you can add mitoxantron on top of that and maybe extend the median survival time out to about nine months. And then if they fail with proxicam to become unblocked, then you can think about things like stenting and stuff like that. First line is just proxicam. Is Jeff in surgery next door? Thank you. So I've been in surgery here too long and I'm getting bored. So I'm going to get Jeff in here to close for me. Okay. All right, so we are going to have this little wrinkle here, which isn't a big deal. Um, I might get somebody to grab onto that with a towel clamp just gently. Because if you put the tissue under tension, it's going to be a lot easier to close. Uh, looking for my mayos. Yes, thank you. Cut that little bit of skin off. found Jeff. I'm, I think I've been saved. Because honestly, as a surgeon, I have a pretty short attention span. Hey, Jeff, I'm getting bored. Cool. That's when I come in. Just like any human surgical oncologist, they have the resection team and the reconstruction team. And Jeff is the reconstruction team. Solely the Plus, I feel bad about making Jeff write the surgical report when he didn't even scrub in. So this allays my guilt. Yep. All right, so we can release that now. All right, I'll leave this to Jeff to do the rest of the intradermal. I'll come over and check the questions. Um, so as far as limiting mobility, generally what we do is just restrict activity to leash walking only for about two to three weeks. If it's healed at two to three weeks, then we let them go ahead and return to normal activity. Um, the thing that we see most commonly as a complication on these would be necrosis of the distal tip of the flap occurs in about 10 to 15% of cases. So exactly where Jeff's fingers were, right there, that's what we usually lose when it happens. You'll lose about 10, 20% of the flap there. And if that occurs, sometimes we'll do another revision surgery or alternatively, we'll just let it heal by second intention. So 
Um, go ahead and leave it at that. So just a routine intradermal closure from this point. Thank you very much for watching. That should be pretty much it for me today, although I should have some more surgeries tomorrow. So if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our channel and make sure that you turn on notifications so you'll get a ding on your phone when we start live streaming again. Thank you.